very pleased to introduce Edward T. O'Donnell. Edward O'Donnell is a history professor at Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts, where I grew up. He hosts a popular US history podcast called In the Past Lane, and he writes history themed fe feature and opinion pieces for the Huffington Post, Newsweek, and the New York Times. O'Donnell has also created courses for the Great Courses Company, including one called Turning Points in American History. He is the author of several books, including Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality, Progress and Poverty in the Gilded Age, Visions of America, A History of the United States, and the topic of tonight's talk, Ships Ablaze, The Tragedy of the Steamboat General Slocum. So, Edward, I will turn this over to you. Hold on, I'm going to unmute you. You may have to unmute yourself. All right. Oh, there you go. Good to go? Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you and uh, welcome everybody in this uh, strange new world in which we find ourselves. So, uh, making the best of it. I would uh, love nothing more than to have had an opportunity to zip down from central Massachusetts to give this talk in person in, uh, in New York. So uh, perhaps at a, at a future date. But um, this is a, a lot of fun. I, whenever I get a chance to talk about the Gen General Slocum, I'm always struck by the fact that um, how much time has passed. I, I started this book in, or the book that, that um, eventually came out in 03. I started in January of 01. And uh, at the time, when the book was uh, pitched to Random House, it was pitched as uh, the worst, the deadliest day in New York City history. Um, and just seven months later was 9-11. So I had no way of knowing that it was gonna be suddenly, um, well, first of all, it was an unknown tragedy. People had completely forgotten about it. And then the other was that it was the deadliest day in New York City history. And then with 9-11, people start talking about the Slocum again. And uh, it also then became the, the second deadliest day in, in New York City history. So what I'm gonna do is take you through the, the you know, the wide angled look at this, you know, what the community was, who these people were, uh, what actually transpired on that day in June, you know, today's the, the, the actual anniversary, what, ap what ex transpired on that day, and then at the, the aftermath, like how people at the time processed it, and also how ultimately society, for the most part, pretty much forgot about it. There are lots of people who know about the Slocum, but it's pretty well, you know, if you stopped anybody on a street corner and said, what's the big fire in New York City history? they'd reference the Triangle uh, Fire, which happened seven years later. So we'll talk about that, um, that part towards the end. Um, one other thing was, I mentioned 9-11 before, you know, 9-11 was very much sort of in my mind the whole time I was writing this, um, because it was, you know, such a monumental thing. We had been living in New York City uh, for 13 years, and had just moved away from New York um, when, uh, just like a couple weeks earlier. So it was really, and then having traveling back for funerals and all, um, Trying to getting a sense, um, almost 100 years later, um, what it was what it was like to go through a mass tragedy like that, and how people uh, processed it, how a city processed it. All right, so with that, let's jump into. Um, oops, I'm getting. It's not allowing me to. Hang on a second. I am not. My. My slideshow is not allowing me to advance. Hang on. There we go. All right. Nothing it could be finer than a technology glitch that is minor, as somebody once said. So the community. We're talking here of this story is very much, it's a citywide story um, in 1904, but it's mostly a German-American, little Germany story. And so this is the area right at, you know, in the lower east side of, the, of New York City. Here's a, a map from 1865 and it shows uh, the old ward system in New York. And the wards that are there in orange, you can see that's Little Germany, Klein Deutschland. Um, it doesn't mean everybody in there is German. There's lots of Irish people. There's lots of you know, increasing numbers of Italians. It's very multi-ethnic, uh, but it's predominantly German. And that's the language you'd hear on the streets. Uh, that's that you'd see an overwhelming number of German stores, uh, beer halls, uh, newspaper stands with, with German language uh, newspapers. Um, it was your quintessential ethnic enclave, just like all the ones we've seen evolve over the years. Um, and at the time, we should point out the green wards down there. Those are the ones where the Irish were predominant. And they're the, the Irish and the Germans are really the two predominant groups that came in the mid-19th century. 
And so by 1880, 1885 or so, Little Germany has over 80,000 Germans living in it. So it's a very dense, very German. It, it's in many ways probably one, one of the largest German enclaves outside of um, uh, the German parts of Europe at that point. All right. And of course, it, I mentioned beer halls and newspapers, but of course, churches, synagogues, any kind of a community institution, you would find them in abundance um, where the language would be spoken, where the German songs would be sung and so forth. And St. Mark's Lutheran Church was just one of those many churches um, on East 6th Street, um, established in the 1850s. And it was you know, a thriving church. And churches in those days, of course, were much more than just um, places you went on Sunday. They were there were schools attached to them. They were community centers. They had big, you know, long lists of uh, public events and so forth. Um, and one of the events was um, the annual trip that goes awry in June of 1904. Um, the church got a new minister in 1882. His name was Reverend George Haas. He was only 28 years old. Um, and he uh, is instrumental in kind of boosting this kind of public programming and community building uh, in the neighborhood. And he's the one who institutes the annual June outing, um, the one that um, by 1904 has become quite an affair. Um, in, in 1887, the first one was just like a picnic in Tompkins Square Park. It was just a small affair, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger, it became a much more um, important kind of central event. It was kind of an event that everybody looked forward to and, and talked about. It was uh, meant to kind of commemorate the end of the uh, school year and um, the beginning of summer. So they always tried to situate it in June. And you could get a sense of just how important this event was. They printed a 20-page booklet. You know, this is the, the cover of it uh, from June for the June 15th, 1904 event. And uh, if you fl flip through the pages, which I've had the opportunity to do so, um, it tells you all the music that's going to be played that day, all the food, all the uh, events. It's just packed with, you know, all the fun stuff that everybody's going to do. We'll head out really early in the morning. And the idea was that they would go to a picnic grove on Long Island. So about a, you know, an hour long trip up, up the East River and then through Hellgate and into Long Island Sound and pull over at one of these beautiful parks that had swimming and picnic tables and all kinds of stuff. And then they'd all come back sunburned and exhausted at the end of the day, because that's how it always uh, had gone. And they rented um, a, one of the bigger and better known boats, um, steamboats in the harbor. Um, the General Slocum, which was named for a uh, congressman from Brooklyn who had been a general in the, uh, in the American Civil War. And the Slocum was a very impressive boat. It was first launched in 1891. Um, big, big boat. Look at all that open decking because it was really designed to be an excursion vessel, vessel to take people uh, where the, the trip itself was an event. They'd go out and see sailboat races. They'd go out and see fireworks. Uh, they'd take, it, it was chartered. Sometimes it was, uh, they would sell tickets to take people out to see. Um, special events. It's about 300 feet long, um, has a big paddle wheel on the side, could go about 15 knots. And so when it was launched in 1891, it was definitely the best known uh, uh, one of these vessels in the city. By 1904, it had been surpassed by others, but it was still a well-known and highly regarded uh, vessel. So the church rented it for $300. And uh, this is not them loading on onto the boat. This is, this is a different event, but this is exactly what it would have looked like on that morning. Uh, the Slocum pulls up to a pier on East 3rd Street, and 1,300 plus people uh, file their way onto the boat. And uh, as they do so, the, the band is already playing, a German band. Um, everybody's incredibly excited, for, you know, whole entire families, um, multi-generational, you name it. And it turns out that June 15th, 1904 was a spectacularly beautiful day. You know, bright, bright blue sky, warm, um, looking like it's going to be the ideal day uh, to get away from the city. And that's an important thing. Most of these people are working class people. They don't have the, they don't go away on vacation. Um, they don't get, have these opportunities to get away all that often. So this is a, a big deal. And so, as I said, something that they really looked forward to. Here's what the Slocum, this is again, not the day of the event, but this is a day of a similar event where you can see just jammed with people. Um, there were fire codes in those days and maximum capacity, but they were things that people basically didn't really pay too much attention to. Um, and that's, a, that's part of the tragedy that we'll get to in, in just a moment. So what happens is that it's a beautiful day, 1,300 people load onto the vessel, and it starts to chug its way up the East River, and other boats are, you know, honk honking their horns at them, and people are, you know, looking at this spectacle of, you know, 1,300 people off to have a, and it was on a, it was on a Wednesday, so it was a midweek, 
Um, and it, clearly these folks are gonna, you know, gonna be having a tremendous uh, day, at least that's how uh, people perceived it. Um, because the uh, vessel was out on the water, parents let their kids run freely. So they, didn't, they weren't worried about them getting lost in the woods or you know, getting into any trouble. So there's a real kind of freedom on board the boat and that's gonna play into some of the tragedy because once the fire is discovered, people aren't unable to find their, their loved ones. We don't know how the spark started, um, but we do know where it started. So if you look towards the front or the bow of the vessel there, you'll see a part marked in orange, and that is a storage room. And in that storage room, there's all the kinds of things you find in the storage room, lots of you know, cans of paint and oily rags and uh, tools and nails and all kinds of just stuff in there. And it's, it's windowless, but it does have air vents coming in from the, the, the bow of the boat, boat. So it has airflow coming through it. And you'll notice it's at the bottom of a set of stairs. Uh, so if, if you wanted to diag or you know, if you were to have a study of the vessel before this event and say, what's the worst place for the fire to have started? It, they would, it would be that room because it's, so, it's forward you know, towards the front of the vessel. Um, and it's, it's got a huge source of, um, of air roaring through it. And what happens is smoke starts coming up the stairwell. And, it's unknown what started the fire, but it was a smoldery fire, it wasn't big. A deckhand went downstairs to check it out and pulled the door open. And when he pulled the door open, um, it gave a gush of air and the smoldering embers, maybe from a cigarette or something, uh, burst into flame. There's a lot of hay on the ground. And he just ran away. He ran to go get help, but he left the door open. And then that led the fire to, as you can see in the next slide, the fire to, to move out of the room and then get into that, um, that bottom of that stairwell, um, and then to begin to just you know suck its way or push its way up the stairs, following the oxygen. Um, one of the things I studied a lot in this book was studying how fires work and how you know wh what are fires all about. And I remember the first time I really learned this that which never you know you know this but you don't know. You think fire wants fuel, and by which you mean fire wants wood. The fire actually wants oxygen, and so this fire is seeking you know wants to literally escape the bowels of the ship and get up into the open air where it can really uh, begin to spread. And this is what you'll see in any uh, drawing of the Slocum is a huge ball of fire on the forward port side uh, exploding out of the side of the vessel. And then of course the vessel's moving at 15 miles an hour. So it's, it's moving in a way that is gonna push the fire inch by inch, foot by foot back towards the end of the vessel. Uh, pushing all the people towards the backside as well. So, you know, if, it had, if the fire had occurred in the stern, it could have caused a lot of problems, but it wouldn't have spread nearly the way that it did. Um, if you think about the rule, stop, drop, and roll, you know, from fire safety, the, uh, the reason you stop and drop is that if you run while you're on fire, you're going to fan the flames. And that's, this boat is essentially running uh, on fire, running up the East River. And so this fire that starts out pretty small uh, quickly becomes, by any definition, an inferno. And, this is a drawing done by a, a newspaper artist based on firsthand testimony about what it was like to, uh, when the fire just spread incredibly rapidly because of the, the conditions. The boat, I should say, was made of wood. The boat had been painted many, many times over with highly flammable lacquer. Um, so everything you could possibly imagine you know, that would, would lend itself towards a disaster, it's all there. And so people are rushing to get away from the flames, they're rushing back towards the uh, stern of the boat. We should point out that um, almost nobody in 1904 knows how to swim. Uh, swimming is very much a 20th century thing where people, you know, through YMCA's, through public education, uh, you know, public schooling, learn how to swim. It becomes much more normal to learn how to swim. But in 1904, particularly children of immigrants, uh, you know, swimming is like piano lessons. I mean, they're just simply, it's not something that they're interested in, not something that's seen as a necessity. And you add to that the fact that these people are dressed up not like we would go to the beach. They're dressed up like they're going to church. Uh, they're wearing heavy boots, heavy dresses, heavy wool suits. So even if you could swim and you were pushed over, over the side of the vessel because of the fire, your chances of surviving in that uh, East River water are very uh, slim. And so people begin to pour over the sides of the boat and naturally rescue boats begin to follow along, trying to catch up to the slocum, um, plucking occasionally people out of the water. But the um, problem is that people, you, if you fall into the water and don't know how to swim, you typically drown within 90 seconds to two minutes. So it's not a lot of time, especially in churning water, especially with other people around you who are going to grab onto you. 
in, in, in a panic, you know, pulling you and themselves down. If you've ever trained as a lifeguard, which I did a, decades ago, most of the training is about how not to be drowned by the person you're trying to save uh, because they're so panicked about being in that state of drowning that they will grab onto you and pull uh, the two of you down. All right, so that's uh, the scenario. Now, so there were hundreds and hundreds of life, pre life preservers on the boat, but they were uh, rotten. And so people would pull down the life preservers and they would crumble in their hands. Or in some cases, they wouldn't crumble and they would put these things around the necks of their children and, and throw their kids into the river and throw themselves into the river. And these uh, life preservers were filled with cork blocks, you know, blocks of cork that had disintegrated because they had never been replaced. And so cork, a cork block is very buoyant, would definitely keep a, a child or an adult floating. Uh, but cork dust is like flour or dirt. You know, you get that wet and it's just going to pull you right down. So um, people thought they were saving their own lives and the lives of their children, but they were in fact uh, putting, you know, 20 pounds of sand around their necks and throwing them into the, into the river. One of those compounding horrors of, of the tragedy. Uh, and this is yet another, you know, this is actually on the cover of my book. It's a very vivid uh, image. You can see people just flying, flinging over the side in total panic. Um, people describe the scenes where they would be hanging onto the railing, hoping, you know, for somebody to come along and pluck them off the boat or the boat to pull into a pier. And then a crowd of 20 people would just come rushing at them um, and crash through the gate and pull it, and everybody pours into the water. Um, you know, you, you're in a frenzied state um, where your, your faculties are not with you. And, you know, pure, pure panic makes people do such things. They're not trying to be, uh, harm anybody, but they are, they're in a, you know, trying to get away from the flames any way they can. And again, if you think back to the, you know, one of the many parallels, people, you know, we know that from 9-11, people jumped from the upper floors of the World Trade Center. And you think, who could do that? But, you know, when you're faced with 3,000, 4,000 degree heat, um, you know, your body physically makes you jump, makes you move. And that's what we're seeing here in a smaller uh, scale. And notice also how heavily dressed people are. These are uh, people in very heavy dresses. They're wearing boots. Um, you also see lots of people hanging over the edge, hoping that they can hang on long enough to, to get to safety. Now, the captain of the ship is uh, probably one of the best, he's one of the great veterans of the New York Harbor and New York waterways, Cap Captain William Van Shake. He is highly regarded uh, as a captain. He had been awarded a year earlier, sort of a medal of safety that he had never, you know, had anything more than a couple of small incidents, never lost a passenger. Um, so he is, you know, in some ways the perfect captain uh, for this trip, except uh, in the moment he makes a very fateful decision. So once he's alerted that the fire is raging, and he didn't know about it till it was well engaged because he was sort of up and above it, being in the where the captain sits. And by the time he found out, the boat was fully engaged. So right at that moment, he has three options. One is to immediately bring the boat into a, a pier. And if you've ever been on the East River, it's not very wide at all. I mean, it would, you, you can literally see the, the piers on the, to the left and piers to the right. He could have easily done so. Um, he decided not to. He thought he would set off a fire um, or set off, you know, set off gasoline tanks or something. So that's one option he didn't take. The other option is to stop completely in water. Stop, you know, bring the boat to a halt. You know, turn it in a circle and get it uh, to stop. And that would prevent the, that stop, drop, and roll problem. He would not be fanning the flames. The boat would still be on fire. It would also allow rescue vessels to surround the boat and uh, pull people off. He decides not to do that. He knows that just what seems like very close by, by now he's in the Hellgate, um, you know, just above Roosevelt Island. And he knows there's a little island a little bit further up called North Brother Island that it has a easy kind of a, a small beach that he thinks he can kind of swing the boat into the beach. And he also knows there's a hospital on the island uh, and that hospital could provide medical care. So he decides to floor it essentially. So he doesn't stop, drop and roll. He sprints essentially up the East River. And as he does so, the flames just push, 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 push back. More and more people pour over the sides. Um, it's one of those seemed like a good idea at the time decisions, but turned out to be the absolute worst decision. Um, you can't fault him in some ways because he's in a difficult position, but you would have thought that somebody with so much experience would have made a, uh, a better decision. So here's the East River, and you can see if you get good eyesight, you can see there's arrows pointing you along that skinny little thing in the middle, that's Roosevelt Island off the east side of Manhattan. And uh, you can see the Slocum, that's pathway going up past the um, Roosevelt Island, then into the Hellgate, uh, past Ward Island, Randall's Island, 
And then that's North Brother Island, um, right off the Bronx shoreline. And he knows there's a hospital there and a, and a small beach. So he thinks he can kind of snug the boat into the beach. Well, he doesn't. Uh, he gets it close to the beach, but it catches ground in about 10 feet of water. So instead of getting it in really close where people could jump off and be say chest deep or waist deep in water, they're still as good as a thousand feet, you know, in a thousand feet of water. If you don't know how to swim, 10 feet of water is the equivalent of, of a thousand feet. So, and of course the boat is fully engaged at this point. People pour over the sides, hospital workers come rushing out. Some of them know how to swim. Some of them grab little boats. One nurse grabbed a ladder and she couldn't swim, but she walked out to her chest and then extended the 10 foot ladder out and was able to you know, pull a couple people in. Very innovative. Kids on the, sh and, uh, adults and children and policemen on the Bronx side jumped into boats, commandeered boats and, sw and rowed out and pulled people um, off the boat. Um, there was a great uh, moment that I capture in the book of a, a tugboat captain named Jack Wade, he had a very small tugboat that drew, had a very shallow, shallow draft. And he brought his uh, tugboat in and it caught fire. The windows on the boat exploded, their hair caught on fire, but he pulled it right up to the stern of the Slocum and pulled like 40 people off. Um, an incredible act of, of uh, bravery, uh, saved a lot of lives that day. And there were many other stories, maybe not quite so spectacular, but incredible stories of people risking their lives to save others. But it's all over very quickly um, because as I said, it, drownings are 90, min 90 seconds to two minutes. And so, and a lot of people had been left in the wake of the Slocum as well. And so very quickly, the rescue operation after a few minutes becomes basically a recovery uh, operation. And that's what you see here. One of the, if you, I'll show you some images in a moment. You'll see many, many boats like this out in the river looking for victims. There, there are no uh, survivors after a few minutes. And uh, the scenes are captured, as we'll talk about in a moment, but the media descends on this. It becomes a very kind of an, an early, uh, well, let's, let's put it this way, the, the availability of photography and uh, the 20 something daily newspapers in New York means that it's gonna get heavy, heavy coverage almost immediately. But this is a typical picture of just dozens and dozens of adults lined up on the beach, their faces covered by any fabric that the police and the fire department and the rescue workers can get. And then people in the water there in the, in the background uh, looking for more people. There's another shot and there's that ladder, probably the ladder that is described in some of the literature um, used by the nurse who, who went out to her chest in the water and then extended that ladder out and saved a few people. Lots and lots, and here you could just look at the heavy boots people are wearing, you know, just in, and the, the thick multi-layered dresses. Hard to imagine a mother with five children, you know, being able to keep herself afloat, let alone, um, you know, being able to save her children as well. So it's a heavily documented, I, I always marvel at this photo. I can, you know, you, you look at it and you kind of get, in some ways can get a little numb to the, the number of people that are, you know, covered in cloths and so forth. Um, but you have to imagine the, the soundtrack to this scene, right? This is a scene of absolute chaos, screaming and crying, people running around looking for their loved ones, looking for their children, looking for their husbands, um, complete uh, total chaos. And eventually, um, you know, the, the formal proceedings of, of you know, the post-disaster um, procedures come in place, the coroner shows up and they begin to transport um, bodies to the, the city morgue, which is unable to take more than uh, 40 people. So they have to establish a, a temporary morgue. The city temporarily runs out of coffins. It's that, it's that sudden a, um, an event of over a thousand people uh, being killed. Um, so in some ways, an emblematic moment, you know, scene here of, of just how huge the scale of the tragedy was. Um, I'd mentioned earlier that the media um, gets word of this very quickly using, you know, new technology like the telephone um, and speeding their way up to the Bronx to, to get the, the scoop, as it were. I mean, there's pictures, this is a picture of a, a victim, a survivor, um, telling their story to uh, the media and to uh, local, local police. And then, you know, this is the era of extra, extra, read all about it. You know, you've got 20 plus daily English language newspapers in New York City, and they are churning out you know, extras, extras, extras all day long, because it was a morning tragedy. You know, it was all over by about 10 a.m. Um, you can, if you have good eyesight, you can see, I think this one says, yeah, extra number seven in the uh, upper left-hand corner. So, and of course the body count at this point, they're thinking, whoa, this is 
astonishing tragedy of 300 plus people. Um, but then by the end of the day, this is the New York World, Joseph Pulitzer's paper, um, the list of Slocum's dead may now reach 1,000. So they, it didn't take very long for them to realize just how bad this was. 1,300 people on board and over 1,000 uh, lost. And then, the, you know, once, and then the word spreads from the site of the tragedies all across the city. And um, friends and relatives who didn't go on the trip, many of whom thought that they had been, you know, they had felt cheated and wronged by the fact that they couldn't afford to go on the trip or they had to work or what have you, now find themselves uh, being informed of the tragedy. And what do you do in that circumstance? Um, the scene, you know, the way that people described it at the time was, you know, a guy running his deli or a person running their, uh, you know, their, their contracting business and somebody bursting into the office or bursting, finding them and explaining what had happened. Like, where do you, where do you go? So many people first went to the local police station to get answers and there, there were no answers. Um, they also then went to uh, St. Mark's. So here's St. Mark's on East 6th Street uh, with hundreds and hundreds of people gathered outside. And by now you can use, actually see a policeman at the top of the stairs there. They're not letting everybody in, but it's the first sort of place where people are gathering information putting forth names of people that they knew who were on the boat, who haven't been accounted for, and they're trying to get a, get a grip on it. But the third site uh, that people went to was the morgue. Um, the city morgue couldn't handle it, so they did, they, they took one of these, you know, basically like an aircraft hangar. It's a covered pier uh, on the East River and converted it into a temporary morgue. And so what you're seeing there are rows of, of uh, ready-made, you know, recently built coffins, and they are filled with a victim and with ice. That's the way it was done in those days. Um, and you, that's why the floor is wet. And, that, and you can also see the way that they've chalked up uh, one end of the coffin, because what they're doing here is they're parading people. Imagine being one of those survivors, you know, a husband or a brother, um, a sister, and having to walk through this scene looking for your, your missing relative or your missing relatives. Again, the soundtrack to this must have been, you know, pretty, pretty intense, to say the least. You will see in, in seven years an exact replica of this photo, which is the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. They do the exact same thing in the exact same place. It's not nearly as many victims, but it's the same setup uh, to allow for friends and you know, relatives to come by and, and uh, try to claim their loved ones. Here's a scene outside the morgue, you know, just heavy police presence to try to keep order because people are so desperate. And you can imagine the feelings waiting to go into the morgue, right? You want to go into the morgue to find your sister, brother, father, what have you, but you also don't want to find them. You know, you're hoping against hope. If you remember after 9-11, if you were living in New York City, the thousands and thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of flyers people put up all over the place. Have you seen this person? Have you seen this person? In the back of your brain, most people knew after a certain period of time that there was no chance they were gonna, that loved one was, was still alive, but there was hope there. And so this is, you're seeing a similar thing. And in fact, in those days, people didn't have photocopiers. What people did is they grabbed the family photo off the mantelpiece and ran down to the morgue and ran to you know, the police stations and ran to the church and held up their, their loved one's photos, a single version of those posters to say, can you, have you seen this person? Uh, and then of course, lots of, lots of waiting, um, waiting for answers. Another scene from the, from the temporary morgue. And this is the backside of the morgue where you have a line of, not, not surprisingly, a line of hearses waiting, waiting to take. Once somebody was identified, they were then put in touch with one of these funeral directors. Some funeral directors were great. They just took care of people at cost or barely at any expense. And some people gouged people, you know, these kind of events bring out the best in people and um, also bring out in some, in some cases, uh, the worst. Now this was a big deal, not just in New York City. Here's City Hall um, covered in black bunting. But um, because this is 1904, we now have a global media. We have, you know, uh, ability to, con to for the world to find out about these things. And so very quickly, this is news and headlines all across Europe and throughout the world um, where people know of this extraordinary uh, tragedy and money and sympathy will, will, will come in from European leaders. Um, European groups will send money, will send expressions of, uh, of sympathy. So it's, it's a pretty which a pretty big deal, which again, makes it kind of interesting or raises that question, how could it be so quickly forgotten if it was such a big deal uh, in its time? Or let me put it another way. Can you imagine 60, 50 or 30 or 40 or 50 years later that so nobody would really remember 9-11, you know, it would just kind of have faded away. Um, it's interesting to think about how public memory works. 
The next step after finding people was to, to all the funerals. And one decision given the volume of uh, the tragedy was that they decided no churches, no synagogues, no, no formal funerals. They're all going to be done in the home, which was actually a fairly common practice in those days. But they just said, we can't do, you know, we've got each minister, each priest, each rabbi has got so much work in front of them that they're, they're simply going to go to go to a house, do a funeral, go to another apartment, go to a funeral, go to another apartment, do a funeral, literally one right after the other on the hour. Uh, and they couldn't do that in a, in a church or in a, uh, a synagogue. So the funerals begin. Um, and there, you could, this is a map from one of the local newspapers. It's the New York World. And they, I think this is actually called the Map of the Death District. And so you can see Tompkins Square Park if you want to orient yourself, Stuyvesant Squ Square. And all those dots represent death or missing persons. So it's heavily concentrated. You've got people from Brooklyn who died on the, on the boat, people from New Jersey, people from all over the, you know, all over Manhattan. But um, for the most part, it's concentrated, heavily concentrated uh, in that uh, East Village, uh, West Village area. Now, because there were so many funerals, um, there was, you know, it was, it was overwhelming. And so the media, and uh, in, as it turns out, most of the people of uh, Little Germany concentrated or at least tried to attend one funeral. And that was the funeral. Uh, this is Reverend Haas. You can see him um, at the bottom of the stairs. I'll come in close here. <clears throat> but Reverend Haas is the bearded man uh, holding his hat next to another man uh, right sort of in front of the horse or about to be in front of the horse. This is the funeral of his wife. He was the, you know, the the, the pastor of this congregation, this is his flock, and they've been absolutely devastated. Um, he was incredibly brave. Um, it was badly, badly burned uh, and in shock after the fire. He, uh, you know, just saved a lot of lives on the boat. Um, and in the end, he lost his wife, his daughter, his sister, other members of his family, um, completely shattered his, his life. And so the community turned out for his funeral and, and you can see, I'll, I'll back, actually back up, you can see people hanging out of windows. Uh, other shots show people on rooftops. The streets are completely choked with, um, with onlookers because he, his pain and his suffering, his loss is sort of emblematic of, of everybody else's. The other funeral um, that really got people's attention was the funeral procession of the unidentifieds. So you had uh, over a thousand people uh, who, were, who were killed um, and at a certain point, about 60 something people who were unidentified, um, either they weren't identified or they had been burned or, you know, death disfigures people. So they were, there were about five dozen or so people. And they had this procession through the neighborhood uh, before getting onto ferries and then crossing over into uh, Queens where the, um, where, the, where the burials would take place. And so you can see in the middle of this sea of humanity, you know, just tens of thousands of people on the sidewalks throwing flowers out in front of the Horses, um, you see white horses draped in white kind of netting. That indicates that that's a, a hearse behind them, a white hearse that's, that's carrying probably not just children, a child, but children, because they, they normally wouldn't have done that. And then the one behind it, you can see black hearses behind it. But this one really was, you know, the one where the city turned out en masse, the neighborhood turned out en masse to watch. Um, this, you know, took, took all day for the procession to make its way out to out to the burial ground. Um, this is Lutheran Cemetery in, in Queens. And this is where the, the unknowns would be buried along with most of the other victims in family plots. So this is the huge uh, mass burial that's taking place, 60 something people. And I'll show you that, we'll, we'll circle back to that to, uh, towards the end. Now, the incident was not, you know, it was quite common for big incidents like this to be you know, if it was an explosion that killed people or there was a sinking of a boat or what have you, these were often described as acts of God, you know, in, in earlier eras. But that's not going to fly in the 20th century. And this is, you know, in many ways reflects kind of the um, progressive era thinking. Immediately, people said, this is not an act of God. This is an act of man, of greedy men who skimped on safety, who lied about their safety record, who, you know, broke all kinds of rules all to save money, and then that resulted in this loss of life. And you can see here they're focusing on the death of children. Um, you know, the, the scythe uh, that cuts them down is sharpened by the love of money and disregard of the law. The General Slocum disaster, hundreds of children sacrificed to greed. I think it was something under, on the order of 600 children under the age of 10. So it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of children. Here's a similar one with a child on a, on a slab in the, in the, uh, uh, at the morgue with the angel of death 
on the right and the greedy uh, steamboat company owner um, on, the, on the left counting his, his ill-gotten gain. So an investigation begins immediately into this. Uh, it's a, the coroner in, in the Bronx is put in charge of it. And the first thing they do is they try to find out what happened to the, you know, what, what transpired on the boat. They will um, send a diver down to try to figure out and also to recover people that were trapped inside. Um, and they eventually raise the slocum, pull it off the, the bottom of the, uh, the river. And they don't really learn that much about the slocum. It's pretty much gone. And the whole upper deck, everything is burned uh, and, and removed uh, by, the, uh, by the fire. So there's not a whole lot to learn in terms of you know, forensic piecing together like a black box kind of an investigation. But they try anyway. The slocum will actually be refloated. They'll, they'll sell that hull and it will be used as a coal barge for, for years afterward. Um, and that eventually sinks as well. But the big thing is the investigation. The coroner conducts um, investigations um, before a grand jury and testimony is taken. Um, lots of victims and lots of survivors show up. This is a mother who lost all of her children sitting in the uh, audience uh, telling, telling, uh, answering questions of a re reporter. This is Frank Barnaby. I don't know about you, but he sure looks like a slippery dude to me. Um, and he was the owner of the Knickerbocker Steamboat Company, which was the company that owned the General Slocum and one other vessel. Um, his real job is as a very successful real estate guy. Um, and he, this, this was sort of a sideline business. Well, he is gonna deny everything. He's gonna say the boat was fine. We had plenty of life preservers. The people just lost their minds. The women lost their minds. It was just a crazy crowd that, you know, they, if they had just acted orderly, nobody would have drowned. Um, Inspector Lundberg, this is the guy who works for the, essentially the early version of the US Coast Guard. He inspected the ship just a few weeks before the season, you know, this excursion season began and, uh, you know, didn't spend much time on the boat. Who knows if he stuck out his hand and got a $10 bill, but that was the way it was done in those days. And he signed off, said the General Slocum is fit for another season of taking, you know, over, well over a thousand people on excursions. And so he's obviously gonna face some withering uh, questions about what he did. Um, and then it turns out, um, this is the, the woman uh, who was the secretary of the company. And it turned out pretty, she did a pretty bad job of trying to white out the company records, um, an early version of white out, uh, to try to say that new life preservers had been purchased for the Slocum um, a couple of years earlier and that they were all fine. There were none of them were rotten. And it turns out they had bought those life preservers for the other boat that they owned. And so they tried to switch the invoice over to say it was the Slocum. And this was exposed. Everybody could see that this was clearly fraud, clearly you know, tampering with, uh, with evidence. Um, hold that thought for a moment. Um, rotten life preservers were brought into evidence. And so it was pretty clear what had, uh, what had happened. The star witness or the big witness everybody wanted to hear from was the captain. And here he is, he broke his leg jumping from the ship. So he's got his leg propped up. And he answers the questions, but he refuses, who knows why, some code of honor perhaps, he refuses to blame the company. He just takes the bullet for the company. And he's the one guy, the only person who is going to be, you can see here that 11 people get indicted. Um, you know, Frank Barnaby, the steamship company owner and many others, including the captain. But the captain is the only one who's gonna pay any price. He's gonna be um, convicted of, of negligence and failing to do fire drills and a whole bunch of other things. And in those days it happened on his watch. So he, he was uh, sent away to jail, which would have been the rest of his life. He was eventually uh, pardoned, but um, he did spend a number of years in jail. Now the grief, you know, it's hard to know, hard to imagine what it was like to be um, some of the people who lost family members in, in this tragedy and then tried to you know, piece their lives together as, uh, as the days and weeks and months went by. So I was fortunate enough when I started this book that there was one, there were other survivors, but there was one survivor who could talk. Um, and that was because she was 18 months old. And this is her in the picture. Her name is Adela Liebenau. But she was the youngest survivor on, that, on the vessel. She was um, just six months old. And so how she survived in her mother's arms is, she had no idea, her mother wasn't quite sure either. Um, but she survived. And so a year later, uh, on June 15th, 1905, by then they had raised money and built a beautiful monument over the grave of the unknown uh, victims. And since she was the younger survivor, she got to pull the string to drop the, you can see in the lower picture, an American flag that's draped over the monument. And so she became a little bit of a celebrity. She got covered in all the newspapers. And the reason we know this is that her father, um, 
So we should point out that the Liebenau family was a mom and a, a mother and a father and three daughters. And they went with um, bro a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law and their two children. Um, all, the Liebenau survived and the baby survived, but all the rest were, were lost. So the family was really devastated. And the, her father, Adela's father, kept a scrapbook. And this was, as she said to me, now I got to meet her when she was 98 years old, living in New Jersey, and she had these bulging scrapbooks and all kinds of you know, memorabilia from the event that obviously shaped her life, even though she had no memory of it. And uh, she said, at one point, I was just marveling at the, deep, uh, the hundreds of pages that he, or dozens of pages that he had created. And she said, I think it was his therapy. And I was like, wow, that's right. You know, there is no therapy in 1904, 1905, 1906. But he poured his heart and his soul into, into documenting this incident. Um, and anything that he found that, like, obviously his daughter being in the newspapers, but any kind of knickknack he found, any kind of thing he found related to it. He cut out um, newspaper articles about crewmen who had uh, been involved in the, in the incident, who had gotten arrested for, you know, random things. He was really, it really was his, uh, his obsession. Um, and, oh, and this is the monument that she, she, helped, she helped unveil. The other monument that went up years later was a children's monument, um, and that's in Tompkins Square Park. That one's a lot easier to see. Although if you make your way out to Queens, they will, the, the cemetery folks will show you where the General Slocum, the big monument, uh, is located. Thankfully, this was restored, um, actually, probably about a decade ago, but it, um, it's there. And most people pass it by not quite knowing, you know, what it's about. But back to um, Adela Liebenau's father. So he's a young guy with three young children, and this is the scrapbook, this is the, uh, the, the receipt uh, that he'd pasted in from the day before. And you can actually see he wrote on the bottom of the receipt before June 15th, 04. So to give you an idea of how wonderful this event was, he went, uh, he's a working class guy, he's a bartender. He went and bought a new suit and a hat. So this is, you know, um, kind of a, a big event, like going to a wedding or going to some sort of event. To, so he's pretty pumped, he's pretty psyched to take his beautiful family on this beautiful event. And then the next day, oh yeah, so he spent $15 for the suit, dollar for a hat, which is a lot of money in those days. Um, and then next to that receipt is a receipt from several days later, June 17th, 1904. And he wrote at the bottom after June 15th, 1904. And it is the receipt for a hat, because he lost his hat in the fire, uh, two mourning bands, you know, black armbands, and his new suit had to be cleaned and pressed because it was now not a celebratory suit, it was a funeral suit. Uh, for the two daughters uh, and the brother and sister-in-law and their two children um, who were lost in the fire. And so these two things, you know, this really, I, I lingered over this page. This is the two receipts side by side, sort of bookending the event, the joy and the anticipation on one hand, and there's the utter unthinkable tragedy uh, on the other. Paul Liebenau um, died very young. He died just a few years after the fire, and I think he was 31 years old. Um, she was uncertain about how, what had caused his death, but sort of in her own mind, Adela thought that he just was a crushed man, you know, just, um, and there were many other people who did die of alcoholism, who died of um, suicide, et cetera, uh, because the tragedy was so, uh, so, so devastating. And here's the other thing, you know, talking about no therapy, he cut out of the newspaper lots of poetry. And Ella Wheeler Wilcox was, she's not a very good poet, but she was a very successful poet in the sense, and I don't mean that critically, but her poetry is, very emotive, very, I guess we call it sappy today. But she would write these, she herself had had a lot of tragedy in her life. And so she wrote these very pain, painful poems about loss and about, you know, mourning and so forth. And he cut these little poems out and stuck them in the thing. And you can see the, the lower poem that I, I highlight there in blue, when a baby's soul, when, when a baby's soul sails out. And it's literally, what, a, what does a baby do in heaven when it doesn't have its parents, you know? And it's, it's a very, you could tell that this is something that gave him a way of, you know, some escape or some, some consolation, I guess is the right, the right term. And as spectacular as this event was, and as global as it was, it was an event that quickly faded. And there are, there's no exactly way to say why public memory ended up sort of forgetting the tragedy. But one reason is that seven years later, uh, on March 25th, 1911, in Greenwich Village, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire takes place. Now it's one seventh the, the death toll, right? It's 1,100, 1100 people, almost 1,100 people on the Slocum and 146 people in the Triangle Fire. But the Triangle Fire was sort of embedded in a bigger story. Um, 
it's similar story and then it's immigrant victims, it's corporate greed, but it, it's also embedded in the, the labor movement. These were women who had gone on strike um, and there was a certain kind of higher level of you know, negligence and injustice as people understood the story. And that may be why the Slocum story was sort of bumped, not out of memory, but sort of into second place. Um, yeah, here's a headline from the Brooklyn Eagle about the fire. And then one year later, um, you know, almost uh, slightly more than one year later, the Titanic sank. So in terms of like major maritime tragedy that, you know, you would never forget, next thing you know, there's one that you, that surpasses it um, in April of uh, 1912. Now, far fewer Americans died on the Titanic than died on the General Slocum, but still it's a, you know, the, the storylines of European royalty and wealthy people and the maiden voyage and all of that, 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 that it's a much bigger story story-wise than um, this boatload of unknown, unknown people on the East River. Um, the other uh, thing on its heels, that's 1911, then 1912, and now 1914, World War I breaks out. And so you see an absolute evaporation from the newspapers of any coverage of anything sympathetic to Germans. And so the annual coverage of the General Slocum Memorial Services that had been given heavy coverage in 1905, 1906, 1912, 1913, basically stops in 1914. Maybe a tiny little postage stamp size uh, headline and a little story, but it's gone. Um, it's, it's almost as though society said, we're not gonna publish sympathetic uh, articles about Germans or German Americans uh, because Germans are you know, public enemy number one during World War I. There are a few moments where the story comes back. So that's part of what I just covered there was sort of possible ways in which it was forgotten. James Joyce publishes his landmark book, um, which someday I might read, um, or finish, I should say, um, like a lot of people, uh, Ulysses. And Ulysses is a thousand pages, and it's set in a single day in Dublin, June 16th, 1904, which is the calendar day after the General Slocum fire. Now, of course, Ulysses is fiction, but it, it drew lots, very heavily on real events to sort of make the story. And at, one, at several points in Ulysses, people talk about the General Slocum fire and, and the loss of life and the corruption behind it. So Joyce, indirectly kind of keeps the story uh, going. Um, a decade, about a decade later in the mid 1930s, a fairly successful movie um, called uh, Manhattan Melodrama um, hit the theaters with a pretty all-star cast of uh, actors, as you can see. And the, the, sh the movie begins with a reenactment of the General Slocum fire. They take the event of the Slocum to, to set the story of two boys who survived the fire and then they go in very different directions. One becomes a gangster, one becomes a crusading DA, and guess what, Myrna, Myrna Loy is in the middle. But the, the reenactment, as you can see it in the black and white photo there, uh, is pretty dramatic for 1930s technology, um, but they're, they're using the story of the Slocum to kind of set the story up, the fictional story up. Um, in the 1950s, the 50th anniversary was marked by survivors who by now are in, in middle age. And you can see this is a photo uh, from the New York Historical Society. Uh, which uh, has a lot of the materials, a lot of the records from the, the fire. Um, and then again in 1979, another bit of news stories about the 75th anniversary. And by now it's a regular event. They're still doing the annual commemoration on, on or about June 15th uh, of every year, um, one in the East Village and then one out at um, uh, the church or, or a church near the cemetery. And those go on year after year and smaller numbers of survivors, smaller numbers of children of survivors, but they, they keep it going uh, throughout it all. 9-11, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, brings back the Slocum story because after 9-11, there are all kinds of newspaper stories and you know, news stories about like, when has New York been hard hit like this before? You know, and people say, well, you know, the city burned in 1776 and others pointed out you know, the cholera epidemics and of course, the General Slocum story was brought out as one of those days. So more, a few more people um, learned about the tragedy, but by then it really, and then, the, then a couple of years after 9-11, so that's 01, 04 is the, cent, the centennial. Uh, my book had come out the year before. There was a documentary based on my book um, on the History Channel. So more and more people heard about it, but it was still um, not, not widely known. It didn't come back in a way, you know, I mean, more people know about the Johnstown flood than certainly know about um, the General Slocum uh, disaster. And that raises, um, oh yeah, and I guess the other little blip was um, two years after I had uh, got, got to spend a day with Adela Wotherspoon, um, and uh, uh, about five months after the uh, 100th anniversary, 
uh, she died at age 100. And that got a lot of newspaper coverage. Um, she donated all those scrapbooks to the New York Historical Society. So those records are there for people to, um, uh, to use. But more or less, it's still a, a, a not well-known story. Um, and I think it's what it comes down to is, you know, I, for my, I first began asking the question, how could this be forgotten? And a friend of mine, also a historian, pointed out, he said, you know, actually, it's, you know, that I think that might be the wrong question. It's that, why do we remember so few things? Um, we actually don't remember that many disasters, that many murders, that many assassinations um, that's, you know, that stand the test of time, that they're talked about decades and decades and maybe centuries uh, later. There's just not that much room in the collective mind and imagination uh, for these things to be, uh, to be well known or, or to have perpetuate for a very long time. Um, and we don't know, you know, I remember when 9-11 occurred, people would ask historians, well, how, how is this gonna be remembered? And I said, well, you know, we don't know. And A, it could be completely forgotten, which is hard to imagine, but it could be completely forgotten, um, like the General Slocum tragedy. So I'm gonna stop there and tell you, uh, I wanna thank you for um, listening and for uh, hopefully pitching a lot of questions uh, my way. And I think I'm gonna, um, Ariel is gonna come back in and, or, I don't, or I should say, Ariel, I don't see any questions. So Hi. I don't know if the chat function is. Um... We've, got, we've got a few questions. All right, so you, are you gonna relay them to me? I'm glad to. Yep. Um, oh, no. Holland says bravo. That's nice, okay. thanks, Holland. Thank you. Um, oh, I can see the Q&A now, okay. Oh, yeah. great, okay, perfect. It's on the top. Well, actually, I can't see it. I can see the thing I can click, but it's not, it's not delivering it to me, so. Oh, okay. Um, so well, should I stop screen sharing? Maybe that's the way to do it. Oh, sure. May as well. Okay. Oh yeah. Suddenly I can see the, um, so I'm going to, I'll answer one, but Ariel, why don't you, since you have a, you can, um, uh, you can, um, kind of, if you see one that you think is really worth asking, um, point that one, point that one out. So I'll take the first one that I can see, which is, from Jeffrey, um, if the door was shut upon discovering the fire, would it have prevented the spread of flames? It would have slowed it down for certain uh, because the key thing in that dynamic is air or oxygen to be precise. And so when he opened the door, you know, there are two vents about six feet off the ground um, in the end of the, at the end of the room sort of conforming to the size of the ship. And as soon as he opened that up, you know, it's just a whoosh of air coming through because it's, the air is being scooped from the from vents of the front of the ship. So that just turns a smoldering, smoky fire in the hay to a, 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 a full-blown flame, you know, set of flames. And then he left the door and went to go get help. Um, I should point out the crew was also completely untrained. They didn't know how to hook up the fire hoses. The fire hoses were rotted through. So when they did get a fire hose going, it exploded and, you know, the water went everywhere. And again, every single thing you can think of. We also had a question from the chat about the fire itself. How long did the fire last before the boat sank? Uh, it's probably the whole, I mean, it depends on, it, the entire like inferno was about 15 minutes in the sense that once it really you know, hit, hit that stairwell and started spreading and people began fleeing to the point where they made it to North Brother Island was about 15 minutes. So it's, it's re, it's, it probably felt like an eternity um, and I always tried to think about like, what do you, what would it be like to have survived all that madness and all that panic and all that danger on board the boat? You, the boat beaches or grounds itself off the North Brother Island. And now you get to jump off in 10 feet of water. Like you thought, you think you might've survived the, the trip, but you actually are still in almost as great peril. And then the, the ship continued to burn for hours afterward. That's why I wasn't, you know, there's, there's two answers to that. One is that the, the fire took place for the trip it was about 15 minutes. Um, on fire, and then it burned for hours afterward. We've had a couple of questions um, asking about, um, it seemed like there was sort of an exodus. Somebody mentioned Yorkville. Oh, yeah. um, yep. can, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so um, one thing that, um, one sort of a rule of thumb, not an absolute rule, but a rule of thumb about disasters, is that they tend to speed up pre-existing trends. And, uh, and, so, and so in, uh, just to cite one example of um, Hurricane Andrew, I think, when was Hurricane Andrew, 1992? Somewhere in the 90s, massive hurricane slammed right into, the, into, I think it was Dade County, sorry, I don't know my Florida counties all that well, but the county that it slammed into 
was trending Hispanic, that it was going to go majority Hispanic over the next 25 years. After Hurricane Andrew, it became majority Hispanic in like five years, you know, because people moved. It's a huge population move. And so little Germany is trending to, you know, is shrinking, becoming less and less German, fewer and fewer people, maybe 10,000 Germans, 15,000 Germans by 1904, but still very recognizable. But this is when the huge influx of Jewish migrants are coming in from uh, Eastern Europe, Italian immigrants are coming in. So little Germany is already phasing out, but the, the fire really accelerated it so that Yorkville and German sections in New Jersey and in Brooklyn uh, see a big influx of people who just couldn't bear to stay in that neighborhood. You know, you walk out of your, out of your brownstone every day and you just, you're constantly reminded of the people that were, uh, that were lost. At least that's how people described it. Now, St. Mark's stays uh, uh, as a German church for four, another 40 years. And really remarkably, Reverend Haas, um, who lost his wife and his daughter and, you know, really his sister, um, had every reason in the world to leave. And he was highly educated and he was recruited by universities and other churches. He stayed the whole time. Um, it, it, it's, a, I mean, a real mark, it's, I, as far as I can tell, a real mark of dedication on his part. Do you see one? Uh... Um... Let's see, oh, the cemetery. The cemetery was Lutheran Cemetery. It's now called All Faiths Cemetery. So if you... Uh, just, if you just Google All Faith Cemetery Queens or even just like Slo General Slocum Cemetery or General Slocum Monument, it'll take you right there. They are, um, the people who run the place are very um, accommodating. So if you, just, you call ahead or you show up, they, they know exactly what you're talking about and they can you know, guide you to where to find the, to find the monument. Um, I see that Scott asked a really good question, which is another, um, you know, rule of thumb, which is after disasters, we, we fix everything. Uh, you know, we, we lock the barn door. And so a huge number of uh, reforms took place, just like they would seven years later, after the, the Triangle Fire uh, for factory safety. The U.S. Steamboat Inspection Service is completely, you know, it's full of corruption, full of incompetency. And it's the era of Teddy Roosevelt. He wants to get reelected in, 19, you know, in the fall. And he just sweeps it clean and they reform it. And then they pass a lot of laws saying, you know, you have to, Slocum did not have sprinklers. They're, you know, the life, life preservers were rotten and there was sort of haphazard inspection. So they, they tightened up a lot of those things. So in the years after the Slocum, steamboats got remarkably safer. Um, but you still had disasters. Um, I can't remember the year, but it's soon after, it's like 1910 or thereabouts, the Midland. Uh, the Midland is a, it's an almost identical situation. It's, um, a, in this case, it's a company picnic in Chicago. I think it's General Electric. You know, uh, 2,000 people get on board this boat and it just simply capsizes right at the, right on the, uh, right at the pier. And 900 people were killed. So, uh, and, that, and oddly enough, yeah, no, that's 1914 because it was after the uh, Titanic. And what they did was, after the Titanic, they said you have to have more lifeboats on, on board these ships. So they just took these heavy steel lifeboats and just dropped them on top of the ship and didn't account for the, you know, 30,000, uh, who knows how many pounds. And so the ship was top heavy and that's what caused it to roll over. Um, so you did have disasters, but the fires like the Slocum was really one of the last uh, fires. And as I point out in the book, steamboat fires were, happened all the time. Um, they, they were highly combustible. The steam, the engines exploded um, on occasion. So up until the General Slocum, they, they had becoming fewer and further between, but they were still happening. Thanks. Um, we've had we've had a bunch of questions about the captain. Yeah. Where did he go? Where was he in jail? What happened after he was in jail? Um, All right. Was he, um, was he aware of the deficiencies in the? Yeah, in the but ship? he did. He did interviews after he was while he was in jail, and then after he was in jail, and he stuck to his story. He just said, "Nope, everything was fine. You know, the company was fine. The company treated me well. The company." didn't have an unsafe boat. Um, and uh, so he just stuck with that story. He, the prison, I can't remember the name of the prison, uh, but it's, it's in upstate. I don't think it was Sing Sing, um, but he went to a, a prison for about five years. And then through a petition effort uh, on his behalf, um, President Taft um, pardoned him. So, you know, commuted the rest of his sentence. So it was um, interesting. Um, let me see here. I see, okay, so I see, uh, Jessica, and Jessica Enright, your name jumps out at me because I recognize that as a Slocum name. So um, I hope it's okay, Jessica, if I, if I read this. Um, 
my great grandmother, Catherine Connolly, was a young survivor of the Slocum. Yes, and so Catherine Connolly um, was still alive when I was writing my book, but she was a hundred something years old and un really unable to communicate. She was, I think, uh, cogent, but she um, blindness and deafness made it difficult. But she had done taped interviews, um, videotaped interviews, several times in the years leading up to that point when she could still communicate. And so I had access to those videos from the Conley family and their and, and descendants. And, you know, she's a 99 years old and recounting this story. And, it, and at one point she, she closes her eyes and she says, when I close my eyes, I can still smell the smoke and see the flames. And this is, you know, decades, decades later. Um, so she's one of the people I profile in the book because I got it because it's such a story. She's 11 years old, I believe, and gets on the boat on a, you know, gets a free ticket and thinks she's won the lottery. And of course, um, it, it turns out, um, you know, quite tragically, qu tragically different than that. Um, so hers, that was one of those stories that I had a, a fair amount of detail and also sort of the rest of the story, where, how her life played out in the decades beyond. So really, I was uh, grateful to meet um, Della Liebenau and I was so grateful to meet the, uh, the Conley family and, and, have, and grateful for their help in uh, telling that story. Um, do you see anything, Ariel? That, um, I mentioned the synagogues. Yeah, so there were a few Jewish victims. I wouldn't be able to tell you precisely, but there were, because you, the core of the boat, you know, let's say 1,300 people, probably 1,000 of them are St. Mark's people or St. Mark's adjacent people. But then they're just neighborhood people. It was it probably, it wasn't clear, but it sounded like it was a bit of a fundraiser too. The chip tickets were not expensive, but um, they, they did sell out at a certain point. So. Um, and people invited their friends. You know, this is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious neighborhood. So there were um, a number of uh, uh, Jewish victims and, and uh, rabbis conducting funerals. In fact, I think in some cases, rabbis conducting Christian funerals, just helping out, you know, just doing a quick religious ceremony. Wow. Uh, it was all hands on deck at that point. Yeah. I know, I know that um, that's been happening with COVID also. There's been sort of inter-religious mm -hmm. funerals. Based, mm -hmm. just based on need, basically. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take this as our last question, which I, I like it very much. Um, it's more of a personal question for you, which is mm -hmm. when, when did you first learn about this subject? And, and I will add for myself, um, what, what was it like to write the book about something so tragic? Yeah, well, um... I first learned about it. I was in graduate school at Columbia and uh, I was taking history of New York City with Ken Jackson, who one of the great uh, historians of New York City history. And he said, all right, everybody, just kind of in a random moment, um, who knows what the big fire in New York City's history was? You know, and everybody's hand, including mine, shot up because I knew it was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory file, fire. And he asked a few people, he knew they were all gonna get it wrong. And he said, you're all wrong. Seven years before, there was a fire that was seven times as deadly. I remember that seven and seven, right? Seven years earlier, seven times as deadly. It stuck in my mind. Um, at that time, I was also, I had co-founded Big Onion Walking Tours uh, with Seth Camel. And so we were always looking for stories, always looking for things to bring into our, into our tours and into the tours of the uh, people that gave tours for us. And so, and we had actually been looking to develop a East Village uh, tour. So I was intensely interested in it from that perspective as well as really a, one of those powerful stories that you could, you could tell to a, um, a public audience. And then um, I decided, so that, that's two things. The third is that disaster books, um, you know, um, The Perfect Storm, which take place in my hometown of Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, Black Hawk Down, there's a whole bunch of these kind of you are there dramatic nonfiction books. And I thought, I think I'm gonna try one of those. So I, I wasn't sure, um, I was a, did I mention I was a starving CUNY professor with four little children under the age of five? <laughs> so. I was looking uh, in this case to, to write a book that actually might earn a few pennies. And so um, I had a couple of ideas, but the Slocum story just was so powerful. Uh, and, I, and, the, in, and the 100th anniversary was coming up. So I thought that seems like a pretty good, uh, pretty good hook. So that's how I got into it. And Random House said yes, so I was, I was off and running. But the writing was, um, it, you know, you, you don't wanna say it wrote itself, but it was a, such a powerful story, it had so many resources. You know, 20 newspapers covering every single inch of this thing tons and tons of firsthand uh, testimony, um, big government investigations, so a lot of resources to, to help me write the book. 
But I have to say there were times, the, the power of the, the narrative description of the, of the disaster unfolding and of the funerals and things, there were, I'm not trying to be dramatic, there were times I'd be working like 11 o'clock at night in my office at, uh, at my college and there'd be nobody around. And I would get up and walk the halls, just kind of like decompressing a little bit after having written, you know, about, um, you know, a, a family being swept overboard by the panic crowd and that sort of thing. So it was, it was very powerful. And then the other thing is that, you know, by the time I was doing that, I was also grieving deeply about like everybody else about 9-11. Um, and it just sort of was in the main, in fact, I ended up dedicating the book to the victims of the Slocum and 9-11 because it was just inescapable. The, you know, the frame in which I was seeing this old forgotten tragedy and witnessing the, you know, the after effects of the tragedy that uh, happened in real time. So yeah. I guess that's the, those are the, um, I think the, the most memorable things. Also meeting people, like I said, Adela Wotherspoon and, and the Conley family and many, many others. You know, I still now get emails from people now and again um, who either have just read the book and say they, they enjoyed it, but also people who are connected to um, somebody on the boat or a, a fair number of people writing to say my grandmother was supposed to be on that boat or my great grandmother, you know, and, there, and I document several of those cases as well um, in the book. So it's, a, uh, it's an amazing story. And I uh, feel very fortunate to have uh, had the opportunity to do it. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us. All right. Well, um, maybe next year. I, there was a time when I did a walking tour uh, on the, of the Slocum on the anniversary. So maybe we can, once we all can get back outside again and, and do such things, um, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I agree. It's hopefully a date. <laughs> yes, that's right. Let's, we get to focus on these, uh, be, you know, benchmark possibilities for, uh, return to something closer to normal or right. sort of a new normal. That's right. We're definitely, <laughs> yes, everybody, everybody's into the walking tour. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much, Edward. And thank you to everyone who, who is here with us. Thank you for sharing your time. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, folks. Yeah. Appreciate well, it. And um, well. um, look me up. If you have further questions, I, uh, I'm more than happy to I didn't answer your questions by email, so I'll do my best. <laughs> you know, it is like getting buried in email these days. Thanks again. Take care, right. everyone. Thanks, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.